and that takes me into my presentation. I'm going to wrap up this part quite quickly because I really wanted to unpack and discuss the data. And we talked about this already. What happens when you when we get into these kind of conversations? We all it up to the light, and it's going to be revealing. But as much as we are going to be uncomfortable, we must see these conversations as opportunities. Open dialogue, courageous conversation. And if you notice what I put in red, is personal reflection. That for me is a major one, like I said to you at the beginning. Personal reflection. It's for you as an educational leader to think about your practice. And you have done that so well. I must, honestly, I must say how impressed I was, how impressed I am with this group. And when we come to the implication section of your discussion, implication for practice implication, many of you have given me such amazing reflection, and I'm happy because I believe our education system is in some very good hands because I've seen the reflection, and the reflection is personal. I didn't ask you for, to cite anyone and to quote anyone. It's personal. I like this slide because I want us, you know, walking away from a course like this, we should understand these concepts. We should understand these realities, what it means, you know, about white privilege and power and oppression and stereotypes and passing privilege and colonize, colonialism and intersectionality. Quite a bit for you to unpack. And some of you have been very passionate about the discussions. And I encourage you to continue being passionate about these discussions. You're going to do other courses. Uh, one of my favorite courses I did, um, I did it with um, Professor Jim Ryan also when we unpack them and I think that's 1042. Yes, this course is 1041 and I think that course is 1042. Um, a wonderful course, a wonderful course and some of these issues again will come forward and you get to unpack them and discuss them. And I, I, I have these slides, a bunch of slides just for us to, to realize what's going on in our schools. And so when we pretend that it's not happening in our schools, it's happening in our schools. It's happening in our schools. And so I put these headlines for us to understand what the discussion is about. It is a real thing. Anti-black racism is a real thing. It's not a facade. It's not a story. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a favor. It is real, and it is active, and it's alive, and it's happening around us every single day. We're going to take the next, literally, I'm going to take maybe 10 minutes to do this part and just give you a brief overview. This is one of my workshops that I do. I do this workshop about teachers examining our practice, and it's just a basic quick overview I'll tell you, is understanding self. So we walk away from a course like this, we must understand who we are, understand who we are, our differences that are internal and external, who we are in, in, in terms of our bias and our prejudice, our privilege and our power. We have to be conscious of this, those difference around us. You know, people, 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 I, 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 somewhere we're arguing, we're, People said we truly want um, people to be colorblind. And, um, and people said, oh, in a truly inclusive world, we are supposed to be colorblind. Absolutely not. We don't want you to be colorblind. We want you to see color. You know, and people usually think it was cute to say, I don't see color. You need to see color. I, you know, I don't see race. I, love, I know your, some person's intentions were pure. I know your intentions were pure when you, when you, when you use that quote. I don't see color. I don't see race. Well, guess what? The people of color and the people of different race are saying, I need to see color. I need to see race. Like I go back to my, my, one of my favorite shows, Avatar, where it says, I see you. I need you to see me and to understand what makes me different and, the, you, and, and in light of your own self, your bias and your prejudice. And you have to work on that through reflection. It's not my job to allow to work on that for you. You have to work on that for, for yourself. So who you are impacts how you lead. I always say that. That's my statement. Absolutely. Who are you? And that's like when I said to you one of our first video that we did back in um, January, when you talk about the controversial issues where your policy and who you are as a person is in contention, your belief system, they all impact how you vote. They all impact how you teach. They all impact how you lead. They all impact how you value others. So know your students and their stories. We have already, I think we have already covered this previously. We have to know people. We have to understand people if we want to serve people well. Right? School culture and climate. What is the culture and climate in your school? 
You know, what is the culture of climate in your school? What is celebrated? Who is celebrated? You know, who is celebrated in your school? What is celebrated in your school? You know, who gets to hold the mic in your school all the time? Who are the student leaders? You know, where do they come from? What, can, what are their capacity? What are the kind of, you know, cultural capital that is in your school? Think about that. This is for reflection, not for answers. It is for reflection. Who, I love to use this board. Who gets a display board? And it may sound very simple to you, but it's, if you check it, take a minute to look in your school and see who is represented in your school and who gets the board. I have been to school where only certain people get the board. I have been to school. Let me just say this point blank. I have been to schools where there are few black students in the school, just a handful, but nothing is mentioned about black history month. If one child, and, I, and I've made it, let me be very clear, because of course, you all know that I share with you that I am a, um, presently I'm also an LTO by choice. So I, I'm an LTO also by choice, although I teach at the university and the college level. And um, I've made myself a promise that at any school I am at, because I've been at schools where I'm the only black teacher and staff, predominantly white school, and it will never happen again where I go to a school and there's Black History Month, the shortest month in the year, 28 days. and um, we don't get a, I don't get a board. I don't do a board. If it's even for that one child, it's going to be my task to create that board, even for that one child. And so who gets a board display? And you may say a board display may be a simple analogy, but it's a very important analogy. Who gets, who gets to be included? Who gets to know they matter around the, around the campus, around the school? And so we, we move on. Um, culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy. We talk about this absolutely a million times. But what I really want to leave is one of the three central tenets of culturally responsive and relevant pedagogy. And it is holding high expectations for all students. And that is where we are failing. That is where we are concerned. That is where I'm worried. Because we are just not. And I've seen it in, in our discussions, in I've seen it in many workshops, I've seen it all over. Where you say to a student, well, you just come from away, so you don't have much capacity. And, you know, she's immigrant, so, you know, she don't know, she's so unexposed. And so you teach and you treat in different ways. And you don't have the same expectations of all students. That is why, you know, there's a ton of research out there. I was looking at some research uh, the, about the, the proportion of students in gifted programs. And because it's supported. It's, I mean, yes, you test students are gifted, but, you know, I know, because I work in school boards, that there are also qualitative um, um, implications of people who are selected as gifted. You may do a gifted test, but, there, but I've been I've had to, be, to sit down and, and interview and talk about and answer questionnaire about my interpretation of certain students for, and preparedness and readiness for gifted programs. So I, I hope you don't think that gifted means it was all tested and a number came out the computer and that's why the child got into the program. Absolutely not true. We all know that there are absolute um, 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 qualitative measurement when it comes to selection of gifted students. So think about that in your school. Think about the kind of conversation. Think about who is in the room and what they are saying about certain students when their name come up. Think about it, right? And of course, one of my favorite pictures, I love this picture, I've used it a million times, because it's a, for me, it's a very, um, um, a very good representation of the value of <laughs> representation. Um, and what I liked was that you know, I looked at the ballerina. I look at the neighborhood she came, she came in to show the little kids, to do little girls that they can. But I noticed, what I loved was that she didn't, and I've seen this, she didn't come in there with just, you know, yeah, let me go, I'm going to this neighborhood, let me just, you know, go and let me just talk, let me put on my jeans and my t-shirt and go. She came full on. She came full on. Ballerina, full on. She's in a point shoes. She's in her, 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 um, that name, leave me already, the, 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 the ballerina skirt, forget the right word, right? She's in her stuff, her tutu, that's it, it's right, right in front of me all this time, in her tutu. And you may say to me, you may say, what, 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 what is this going to do? How is this chain stereotype? Well, it's in many ways. And if you don't see this and don't understand it, then... It is concerning that you don't to know that they can. I have been to the ballet, I've been to the, 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 the ballet, uh, I've been to the ballet, 
seen the Russian ballet once when I was in Jamaica, and I've seen the Toronto Ballet Company here. You know, we have to see, let little girls know they can, little boys know they can, and we give them images that says to them, you can. And that's why for me, I realize the value in representation when I go into, into certain places and certain spaces, I turn up and I show up because I need them to understand that yes, I am black, yes, I am immigrant, yes, I am gay, yes, I have a strong, beautiful accent that I love, and I can be what I want to be. And I'm living my best life, and there's more for me to live. And I want the, the little boys and girls around me to realize, you can do it too. You can absolutely do it too. And I show you how, and I tell you my story, and I tell you that it can be done. And so representation is important. We have, we have done this a million times, equality versus equity versus access. And the only thing I will talk about is the next slide. You know, we can prepare so much. We can prepare so much. We can prepare so much. And there are many people who don't understand, and yet they still don't understand as educators the reason why we talk about equity, the reason why we talk about giving certain students more than others, and we still don't have it. I like to use the example with the apple. You know, I like to use the example with the apple to say we have given, you know, try to be a fair teacher so you give each child, you give, you give each child an apple because you want to be the best and they want to be a fair teacher. But the child who, do, who don't eat apple gets an apple. The child who's allergic to apple gets an apple. Now, isn't that just so silly? Isn't that just silly? That because you want to be fair, you give everybody an apple regardless that one don't even eat an apple and one is allergic to apple. And a child there who may benefit from getting two apples would have been would have, would have been quite effective because the child who you give the apple to is allergic is not going to eat it. And the child who you give the apple to don't eat apple is going to maybe throw it away in the garbage. And, I, and that's a whole different topic about waste in our school and other persons could have had. But of course, the value here for me is liberation. You know, you know I, when I saw the first slide, I used to always ponder, how can I give students enough boxes? How can I give this child enough boxes for him to see? How can I? And then it finally occurred to me, I don't need to be given, some students don't need to be given boxes, given boxes, given boxes. What you need to do is, is liberate, pull away the barriers. There are lots of education barriers. I was at a, the same conference, I tell you, the same conference, and I went to a session talking about hiring practices. And that's an entire topic that I will talk about another time. So I guess in this is my final class with you. So I guess when we see each other another time at a workshop presentation, um, somewhere maybe we'll talk about that. Because the hiring practices for some of us looks like this. It looks like this. We have all these bricks standing on. We are just standing on. Our parents know this person, and we have come from this neighborhood, and we were born in Canada, and our first language is English, and we just have all these things standing on. And there are persons who are just, and I can tell you a per personal stories of myself. I could tell you, and I'm not afraid or not ashamed to share those personal stories when it comes to opportunities here. I'm, I'm reminded many times that I am othered. I'm reminded I do have certain privileges, and education has given me that. But I'm also reminded that I'm immigrant, and, and I'm black, in many spaces, many times, when I've gone to interview panels. And the seven and the eight persons on the interview panel absolutely look like they're from the same village, the same neighborhood, the same club, the same restaurant, the same community. And I am the only person who looks different, and I'm on the other side of the table. We have to unpack that somehow and figure out how we're going to change that. And I can tell you, I was listening to HR personnel talking about this. How can they make changes to this? And it was seems like one of the most difficult conversations some of them had because they kept talking about unions and kept talking about how to get around it and kept talking about the pool and kept talking about internal um, applications. And it, it, it was just, it was just, it was just, it was just, yeah, very telling to listen to it and to listen to the conversation. And all I walked away saying to myself, three years from now, when I come back to this conference, this will be a, a discussion that will be ongoing because we are nowhere there yet. And we haven't got 
decided and figure out how we're going to diversify the hiring panel. Because, you know, a lot of people, I've always heard the statement, people like people who are like them. People like people who are like them. But the truth is, let me make sure I, 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 I get this clear, that though I could be on a panel, I could be sitting across on a panel of seven, eight persons who look all of the same, there may be a person on that panel. And it happens. It does happen where you're an advocate, you're an ally, and you're the one saying to the panel when everybody's gone that we need to change things around here and we need to so we need to employ someone who's different. This entire place has one perspective because we all come from the same perspective. And that is why sometimes your program has, your programs fail. And that's why sometimes your program is boring. And that's why sometimes your your policies and your ideas and your initiatives don't don't because everybody has the same idea. Nobody's thinking different. Everybody wants to paint the paint the place green. Everybody wants to paint the place green. Nobody's saying, well, let's paint it white. Or let's paint it blue. Or let's paint it pink. Or let's paint it a fuchsia. No, everybody wants to paint it the same color. So, what we have, what we have. I see such value in diversity. For me, not because I I I, I, I identify in so many ways as others, but there's so much beauty when I go into a room and I see the level of difference in the room. I am excited. I'm telling you, when I went into my face-to-face -face class, I taught this same course, face-to-face. -face last fall, and I walked into the room, there were about three to four Muslim women in the room. There were, um, 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 there were Muslim women in the room. There were black students in the room. There were uh, um, um, immigrants in the room, immigrants who came here five, ten years ago, immigrants who came here a month ago. There was accents in the room so heavy that I had to listen intently, and it was an amazing class. That's how I see it. I see it as an amazing class. When the students from China were sharing about sex education in China, and the students from the Caribbean, who was, their students who were from Trinidad, were sharing about her experience, and one from Canada was sharing about, oh, oh, amazing classroom. Amazing classroom. Loved it. Want to put it on repeat. And that's where you get energy from. Even in this class, that's where you get energy from. When I read the different perspectives, and I, uh, um, Jabin is saying, thank you, Dr. Campbell, for not only providing descriptive feedback, but also back it up with your lived experience. Thank you for that, Jabin. Because it's important for you to do that. And uh, let me just say this to you, um, um, Jabin. Just, re just realize my slide has um, my, my quotation marks here in these 16. And that's fine. Um, I, I'll fix them. I'll, I'll fix them for sure. Um, um, Thank you for, for saying that, Jabeen, because I'm telling you, when I started doing this work years ago, I'm going to tell you, I have tried to, to engage in certain conversations without sharing who I am, and I realize more and more it's hard to do that, and it's really hard to be authentic doing that. Someone asked me the other day, they said, I want to write a book about my Jamaican um, sexual um, experiences growing um, um well, not sexual, but growing up in Jamaica as a child who identified as gay and whatever, and he wants to speak to Jamaican parents, and he's on the DL. The DL means the down low. He's hiding. There's one is in the closet, right? And I had to say to him, I say to him, the kind of work that you want to do, I look at him and I say, the kind of work you wish to do and the kind of book that I hear you want to write, it's almost impossible to write that kind of book as a person who is hiding their sexuality. And I can tell you, I have had to open up about myself in so many ways because I realized that's, that's what is it's authentic. And I've lived experiences. And so when I talk about my job search, I will tell you that story another day. I, you know, I, I can smile and I can laugh now, but those were days that I didn't smile and didn't laugh. I walked out of places disappointed because I'm like, and don't tell me this is my, I'm going to another interview in Toronto. And there are eight people interviewing me, and the eight people are the same eight people. They look the same. They, like, it's like, wow, wow. Couldn't you have infused at something there? So, you know what I'm saying? So you think about these things. And then, of course, you know, you, know, you even know you're not going to get the job. You walk out thinking, I'm not going to get that job. And this is a person like myself who is, who I'm very full of, um, 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 I, have, I, have a, I have a very strong self, a sense of self, self-esteem, affirmation. I speak over to myself. I speak life to myself. 
right? Because it happens. It absolutely happens. And just to share this with you, um, Jabeen, um, I don't know how you self-identify um, because I, I'm not, I've never seen a picture yet of how you identify, but I can tell you, you know, in my, one of my courses, I've had, a, uh, um, I, I've, had, I've had five Muslim women in the class. And I turned and I said, I said, I'm waiting to walk into a school in Toronto with so many Muslim persons in teacher training programs and you are in this class. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to walk into a school and see five, six, seven teachers up and down the school corridor in their hijab teaching and do and living and just being. I, I'm waiting. And you know what? Let me take this and say it may happen. It may be happening, but I, I don't know it. Never been there. I've asked the teachers. Nobody could have shared with me in a school like that. But I'm going to surprise you. There are schools in Toronto where we have a heavy, heavy, heavy population of Muslim students. So it wouldn't it be lovely to walk into the school and see, and see, can you imagine walking to the school and see, you know, a, a, a teacher here, teachers there, the librarian, maybe the vice principal, the principal, you know, in a hijab walking up and down the school campus. Isn't, wouldn't that be something else? It's there. We need representation. Representation is key. So let's move on quickly. We're going to wrap up in about, we have like four minutes to wrap up actually. One size does not fit all. This one, we have, we have done it enough. We have said it enough. And what I love about this one is the fact that we come back to equity and equality. And for those who don't understand, this may drive it home to you more. When if you are going to allow, this is it. You want everybody to climb a tree. But before we even start the test, before we even start the exam, we already know that the pin we're not going to climb, the fish in the bowl ain't going to climb. And I doubt, and what is that? Is that a dolphin or a, like, maybe it's a dolphin? Not going to reach. They're not going to climb. Thank you for sharing. You know, they're not going to climb. <laughs> so that's what I'm talking about. If you, you know, this, this is one of the things we talk about, UDL, Universal Design for Learning. You know, you research some, do some research on that. And as educators, we have, to, we have to realize that there are different ways of representation, different ways of testing. That is why I'm very passionate about allowing students various ways to express themselves in assignment. In this course, you know, you have three different ways to, 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 to write your final assignment. And I'm trying my best in every course that I teach to give this kind of opportunity because we have to come from the place that intelligence looks one way. And, and success looks like one way. And, you know, and we know that we, we know that we have suffered from that kind of imagery where, where success has one look and, and excellence has one look and, and, and female and fe male and feminine and all those things, have, they have one look. Everything is so one look. We have to come to a place where we understand that we are different. And, we, if, and if, we are, if we are celebrating difference, then we have to accommodate difference. And if we are accommodating difference, then we have to understand that we have to accept the different kinds of results. And that is why some children have just never succeed. If you, they will never succeed. <laughs> some children will never succeed in our school because success only looks like one thing. And they will never get it because they're a fish in an aquarium. They are not going to climb. They are dancing. They are not going to climb. Thank you for that, Peter. And Peter commented, um, thank you, Professor Campbell, for reminding us of our calling as school leaders to raise every child and ensure our school communities are inclusive through our intentional activities. Thank you for that word, Peter. That's one of my, that's one of my favorite words, intentional. Okay? Engage in career conversation. Nothing to say here. We have done this. And and, and, and we're moving on to social justice and advocates. That's why you are. That's why you're getting your master's degree. That's why you're getting your PhD. You're getting it so you can continue to advocate for the children in your school. I, I, there's a lot going on about special education. I think it was yesterday, um, 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 Kat and Win, um, that um, um, our politicians were on, at, uh, when I saw it on Facebook Live, talking about um, the money that is going to be invested in special education. A lot, right? Because we have to realize we have to provide. And then I love this. I love this picture. You know, the Oopla years ago, um, uh, um, and last year, I think it was about the Olympics and what happened and the, 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 the Muslim um, skater. And then this is what happened. This is what happened. This is what happened. 
might introduce a a a a a, a, a hijab. This what happened. This what happened. It didn't need anything else. It didn't need anything else. The sad news is that well, no, I don't think it was a sad news. Is that you know. Here comes Nike again, a million billion dollar company making on a billion dollar and legitimizing something that people look at in a very funny way. So again, you know, you can look at this two ways as Nike using its power and its privilege to create that level of access. Yeah, you can look at it that way. Available for purchase in 2018, I guess it's now available for purchase. And the final one. The educational leader as a social justice, we talk about that. Engaging in professional development, constant learning, constant learning. And the final one is my favorite, self-reflection. Look at the, con the continuum. You want to get to a place of cultural proficiency. Where are you? Where are you? And how do you get there? Where are you? And how do you get there? Where are you? And I'm going to leave it as that. These are some questions I ask, you know, I ask, ask myself and I ask you, but we've already asked ourselves these questions. So I want to end the talk on this slide. Where are you? How will you get where you want to go? How will you get from cultural destructiveness or cultural incapacity or cultural blindness to a level of cultural sensitivity, moving to cultural competence, to get into cultural proficiency? where we give our students success.